Hello, and welcome back to part two of the video. Just a quick favor up front, but you can help this video out by leaving a like. And if you haven't yet subscribed and hit the bell notification, especially when I'm so close to reaching 100,000 subs, that would be cool too. In 1976, Busch Gardens would open its first roller coaster, Python, which might not look very exciting today, but was absolutely a huge deal for the time. Opening in Stanleyville, just north of Stanley Falls, Python was manufactured by Arrow. It was one of 10 clones known as the Corkscrew model that changed the coaster industry. The original Corkscrew premiered at Knott's Berry Farm in 1975, and was the first contemporary steel roller coaster to feature inversions. What made this significant is that it was engineered to be safe to experience, unlike some of the sketchy Coney Island coasters from decades prior, which may or may not have had the chance of possibly snapping your neck. With the success of Corkscrew, Arrow had changed the coaster industry and showed that steel coasters with inversions were very much the way forward in terms of attracting people to parks. Of course, every park that could afford a Corkscrew model wanted one, and so Python was a massive step forward for Busch Gardens, especially when it was the only park in Florida to have anything like this. The coaster layout is relatively simple, first taking you up a lift hill and then uncresting it, dropping down a short bit and banking to the right. It would then descend down a steep drop and ascend back up into another right banked turn, then sending riders right through the double corkscrews, and after this, finishing off with another right turn back into the station. I was lucky enough to ride this when I was really young right before it was demolished, and I can say that the experience was actually quite rough, especially as your head would bang between the shoulder restraint as you twisted through the corkscrews. Still, to park goers in 1976, this was far smoother than any wooden coasters that they may have been on, and the concept of a steel coaster with inversions was extremely novel and exciting. Within the mid to late 1970s, Busch Gardens expanded greatly while also working to reinforce its African theme, and Python was just one part of a much larger series of expansion projects. For example, in the same year that Python debuted, Boma was renamed to Nairobi, and Busch Gardens also changed its name to the unfortunate Busch Gardens The Dark Continent. Just a year prior, Anheuser-Busch opened another park in Williamsburg, Virginia, and with its European theme, the original title of that park was Busch Gardens The Old Country. I can understand why the Tampa Park would change its name to distinguish its African theme, but adopting an old colonial term that reinforced exploiting the continent and its people is just outright ignorant, even if I don't think that the intention was malicious. Another major element of this expansion actually came the year before, in 1975, with the opening of the Moroccan Village as the new park entrance, built over what used to be a section of the parking lot. Still existing as the park entrance today, and not really having changed much aesthetically, Morocco is a large shopping and dining area that essentially exists as this park's version of a Main Street USA. It's certainly not as linear, but it's still easy enough to navigate, and is a great thematic introduction to the African theme. Throughout, guests would find plenty of interesting merchandise, some of which was crafted by actual artists from Africa, and plenty of entertainment that ranged from belly dancers to the mystic sheiks of Morocco, a marching brass band that also worked as ambassadors outside of the park. Where Coaster Coffee Company is located today, Morocco also once hosted a theater that played a film known as The Eagle Within. Introduced in 1976 to celebrate the American Bicentennial, there's not really much information on what this was, but the theater would continue showing new films until it was converted into a bakery in the 90s, and most recently now serves coffee. While not too exciting, it's also worth mentioning that Morocco expanded in 1983 with the Marrakesh Theater, a covered outdoor venue that hosted a variety of musical acts and hands-on animal encounters. One strange fact about Morocco is that this restaurant, Zagora Cafe, was actually an old quick service location that existed in the parking lot. Because Morocco was built over what used to be parking space, the original snack bar known as Café Mozambique has actually served people since its introduction in 1967, but was rethemed and expanded its food options to fit into Morocco. I don't know why, but knowing that the structure used to exist as a mundane parking lot snack location is weirdly fascinating. The Moroccan village was quickly renamed formally to Marrakesh in 1976, with the introduction of Python and Nairobi, and is still an interesting, well-themed area that works as a great entry for the park today. Still, Busch Gardens was only getting started, 
and had very ambitious and exciting plans for expansion just within the next few short years. Now with a grand new entry area and a show-stopping corkscrew coaster, the next goal of the park was not just to build new attractions and areas that reinforce the African theme, but also fix the strange layout of the park by closing it into a loop that was easily traversable. In 1977, Busch Gardens opened the Congo as a new themed section of the park just north of Stanleyville, also incorporating some of its former attractions. This included Python and the two flat rides known as Monstrous Mamba and Swinging Vines. There wasn't much else initially added other than the Ubanga Banga bumper cars, which still exist as part of the park today. The Congo didn't really have much to anchor it other than Python, which I think was probably always intended as its major draw, it just happened to be built more quickly than the land could open. However, another notable addition with the Congo was Claw Island, a tiger exhibit that connected the Congo to Stanleyville. While tigers have been in the park since their introduction in Boma, Claw Island only reinforced their relationship to the park's identity, with this new and sizable exhibit. If you really think about it, you might recognize how strange that is, since Bengal tigers are mostly found in India and not at all in Africa. Come to think of it, why does an African-themed park have Asian elephants in its Nairobi section right next to the African belt? Bush Gardens at its core is a great park, but it makes some weird theming choices. Well, you, you, who's the leader of your group? I'm the lead dancer. Could, you, is your heritage Middle Eastern? No, I'm Scandinavian. Jokes aside, this clip is from the opening of the park's next theme section, which is a great segue. While small segments did open in 1979, in 1980, Timbuktu fully opened to park goers and completed the loop, connecting Nairobi and the Congo with the park's most ambitious addition yet. While Morocco had interesting architecture, Timbuktu was larger in scale with taller buildings and took up a larger footprint while also containing dining and shopping. In fact, its main dining location was Das Festhaus, which was a pretty massive space on the inside and served German food, along with providing live entertainment known as the Bavarian Colony Dancers. I can understand the German connection because Busch Gardens was still a brewery at this point, but it is admittedly a weird addition for an area of the park themed to a medieval African city. This venue is still around today, first having been renamed to Desert Grill in 2004, and becoming Dragonfire Grill most recently in 2014, and having offered a variety of musical shows throughout its history. When Timbuktu opened, it also contained a number of notable rides as well, including the Carousel Caravan, which still exists in the park today as the Grand Caravan Carousel. Other notable additions include thrilling flat rides like Sandstorm, which actually managed to exist up through 2013, and a personal favorite when I was a child, the Crazy Camel, which only lasted until 2003. Otherwise though, the main midway of Timbuktu mostly consisted of carnival games and quite a few small flat rides for children. In terms of more exciting attractions, the Timbuktu Theater was a pretty large building that contained an outdoor dolphin show known as Dolphins of the Deep. This was your pretty standard dolphin show that was quite similar to something you would see at a SeaWorld park, although at the time that the show opened, Anheuser-Busch had not yet acquired them, which wouldn't happen until 1989. The show featured dolphins performing a number of tricks, while inserting a lot of comedic commentary from the trainers, and at one point, it did seem to include sea lions in some capacity, though it's hard to find information on when they were added and removed. If I can provide a personal anecdote, this dolphin show was actually my first memory that I can recall, and so it's a personal favorite of mine, even if it's not particularly special in retrospect. However, the show would run through 2002, and the theater would go under construction to become completely enclosed, reopening in 2004 and showing a film known as R.L. Stein's Haunted Lighthouse 4D. At the time, it was compared to other 4D experiences like Animal Kingdom's Tough to be a Bug or Universal's Terminator, but I remember this just not being very entertaining at all, and not reaching the quality of the shows that it was compared to. While produced by Bush, the film did play at some of their other SeaWorld parks, and was licensed out to other parks throughout the United States and Europe. This film was then replaced by Pirates 4D in 2006, and ran for four years, 
also produced by Bush and also licensed out to other parks. It's notable for featuring Leslie Nielsen and Eric Idle, and weirdly enough, it's still placed today at Fantasyland for whatever reason. I can't say that I enjoyed it much better than The Haunted Lighthouse, and I think that The Dolphin Show was probably the best iteration of this theater, especially because I think it became an iconic attraction for this park historically. It was considered one of its better attractions when it was open. Speaking of iconic, the 1984 edition of The Phoenix next to the theater became a staple of this area, and while it may not look like much, was definitely a popular flat ride because of how thrilling it was. Known as a looping starship and manufactured by Intamin, it was essentially your typical swinging ship ride but made a full loop, inverting riders upside down and existing as one of the most thrilling rides in the park for quite a while. This is something that I also experienced, and while I didn't find it particularly comfortable or fun, I did understand its appeal, especially as a kinetic element. For around a decade, the Phoenix was considered one of the more intimidating rides in the park, as its only competition was Python, and segueing into the last major attraction of Timbuktu, Scorpion. This particular coaster opened five months after the grand opening of Timbuktu, and is, in my opinion, definitely a much better ride experience than Python. Python was innovative and popular, but its main appeal was the novelty of its corkscrews, and while Scorpion's vertical loop was still a novel element for guests in the 1980s, it was a much stronger experience outside of just this one element. It pulls some really strong positive Gs as it flies around the track. Manufactured by Schwarzkopf, it's one of the last models in the world known as the Silver Arrow, and still holds up really well to this day. Another personal anecdote, but this was also the first coaster I've ever ridden with an inversion, and while I personally like it for that reason, it's still actually a really solid experience. It's easy to be outshined by the bigger coasters today, but Scorpion is a classic that's incredibly smooth and is still a great anchor for this area. While Timbuktu is the more interesting land in comparison to the Congo, I do want to highlight that the Congo itself expanded with the addition of the Congo River Rapids in 1982. It still exists within the park today and is incredibly popular on hot days as you would expect. Over the years, it has had a bit of additional theming added, and while it's certainly not the best Rabbids attraction I've been on, it's still decent and a good element of park history. Because of its layout, park visitors have to cross one of two bridges over its raging waters into a new but small themed area where the entrance is located. Also notable is that in the queue, there's actually an animal exhibit. I remember it being spider monkeys a long time ago, which, if you didn't know, are found in Central and South America, and definitely not the Congo. At this point in time, the exhibit claims to be home to what I believe are Komodo dragons, which are also not from the Congo and come from Indonesia instead, but the exhibit did seem empty when I most recently went. Still, even if the animals are not actually from the Congo, it was really cool to see them as you walk through the queue to distinguish this attraction. The Congo River Rapids are pretty fun and have decent rockwork and landscaping throughout the ride course. And while it's not the most unique Rapids attraction, it did do a lot for the park when it opened and has become the anchor of the Congo since the removal of Python. Throughout the rest of the 80s and into the early 90s, Busch Gardens would continue adding new attractions to keep things fresh for visitors. In 1986, Morocco opened the Moroccan Palace Theatre, which was built for Broadway-style productions and initially featured a musical titled Kaleidoscope, which ran from 1986 through 1989. What you're seeing on screen now is from the Williamsburg version of the show, which was the original and significantly different, but I think it still gives you a sense of what it might have been like. When it opened, Tampa's version of Kaleidoscope was reportedly the most expensive live theme park show ever created at the time, and was a pretty significant addition to Busch Gardens as a major attraction. In the same year, Nairobi received a new complex known as the Nairobi Field Station, and while it has gone through a few name changes, it still exists in the park today as Animal Connections. The purpose of this complex was to act as a series of exhibits where you could view a large number of exotic animals, and while the majority of them were not from Africa, it was still a nice addition. Its purpose was intended to be educational, allowing park visitors to get an up-close look at how animals were cared for as animal handlers prepared healthy meals 
and gave presentations on animal care and Bush Garden's worldwide animal conservation efforts. Speaking of which, the Bird Gardens would open a new exhibit the following year in 1987, which was a multi-million dollar facility built for two pandas lent out from the Beijing Zoo. Visitors would board a moving walkway and view the two pandas who were named Ling Ling and Yong Yong, which translates to Ringing Bell and Forever and Ever, respectively. They were a huge attraction, but were only on display for a year, and so the enclosure was reused first for white Bengal tigers, and then eventually koalas. With such an expensive investment, Bush Gardens also added additional bird aviaries to the area, which still exists today as the Australian-themed Walkabout Way, which includes the Kookaburra Aviary. Nearby is Kangaloom, which is an interactive exhibit that allows you to get close to and feed kangaroos, as well as observe various Australian birds like emus. The boardwalk structure used here originally led to the panda exhibit, and the actual building was reused for small animal exhibits through the 90s, until it was repurposed to contain scare mazes for Howl a Scream sometime in the late aughts. In 1989, the African Queen boat ride closed and a new thrilling attraction, the Tanganyika Tidal Wave, miraculously opened in July of the same year as the newest addition to Stanleyville. This Shoot the Shoots flume built by Arrow was pretty straightforward, but had a lot more theming than you might expect. As you leave the station, riders round a bend and cross under a bridge that I believe was meant for employees. A bit further down the river, riders move past some concerning elements such as skulls on spikes as they view the drop which builds anticipation. Moving next through a cave, the boat rounds a bend and meanders through scenic foliage. Eventually, riders pass through the African River Village from the African Queen boat ride, which is a clever way of reusing the old theming and allowing this attraction to stand out, instead of feeling like another generic shoot the shoots ride that could exist in any other park. Going through this element in the opposite direction that the boats from the African Queen traveled, riders will also witness more skulls and masks, continuing to build tension for what might lie ahead. Riders then travel past rock work for what used to be the rhino exhibit, and rounding a bend, the lift hill is revealed. On making it to the top, riders are treated to great views of the park, but knowing what's ahead, most were probably more concerned with bracing for the drop. The boat slowly begins to approach the descent, and on cresting the small hill, it flies down two dips and comes down with a mighty splash into the river below. The tidal wave wasn't just fun for riders, but for other park guests as well, as the splash created by the boat would spray a massive wave of water onto the exit bridge. You would often find park goers, and especially children, either standing on the bridge to get soaked, or standing behind the glass structure to observe it. The tidal wave didn't just create great kinetic energy for the area, but was always populated with people who were excited by the splash, whether they were trying to avoid it or not. While also taking up a large portion of it, the tidal wave didn't reuse all of the same area as the African Queen. Instead, the former gorge of the river was actually repurposed as a small scenic exhibit known as Orchid Canyon. It's still there today, but unfortunately isn't accessible unless you go for Hell of Scream, where it's used as queue space for one of their houses. Transitioning away from the tidal wave, Bush Gardens would continue to add animal exhibits, and in 1989, the Clydesdale Hamlet opened just south of the former Old Swiss House. In 1933, August Bush Jr. and Adolphus Bush III created a beer cart pulled by six Clydesdale horses as a marketing gimmick to deliver beer to politicians who helped to lead to the end of Prohibition, with its most famous run being to the White House to deliver to Franklin D. Roosevelt. Since then, Clydesdale horses have become an iconic symbol of the Budweiser brand, and the Clydesdale Hamlet would allow you to explore their stables, or see the horses led around the grassy field out in front. Just a year later, the old Swiss house reopened as the Crown Colony House, as mentioned earlier, now featuring quick service dining on the second floor, and a more upscale restaurant on the third, themed to African exploration with maps and artifacts of interest. The entire structure was renamed to the Serengeti Overlook in 2016, and the third floor has not reopened since 2020, but it's still an interesting piece of park history that is still around. In 1987, Disney changed the theme park industry when it opened Star Tours at Disneyland, which wasn't just popular because of its Star Wars theme, but because it introduced parkgoers to the simulator as a new kind of theme park experience. In 1989, 
Disney would open a new simulator using the same technology at Epcot as Bonnie Wars, and later in the year, a clone of Star Tours would open at Disney MGM Studios. Of course, other parks wanted in on this new and exciting technology as well, and George Lucas's challenge to Steven Spielberg to create his own version using Back to the Future was a large influence in the decision to go ahead and build Universal Studios Florida. Busch Gardens was obviously standing on its own pretty well, and wanting to have their own simulator opened an attraction called Questor at Busch Gardens Williamsburg in 1990. Just a year later, a clone opened at Busch Gardens Tampa, just south of the Crown Colony House, and a building with a similar architectural style to the Clydesdale Hamlet, creating a small, vaguely European-themed area of the park known as Crown Colony. On entering a pre-show, riders walk into a steampunk-themed laboratory and meet the eccentric Sir Edison Fitzwilly. He explains that riders will be boarding the Incredible Velocity vehicle, helping him on his final quest to capture the elusive Crystal of Zed. With this, he can finish his work, and the role of the riders is to use their thought waves to power the jubilium capacitors of the vehicle. Once the attraction begins, riders first dive down under the crust of the earth to search for the crystal. As they approach the mantle, things become increasingly dangerous as molten rock threatens everyone on board. The vehicle then crashes through the rock, and riders find themselves in a cavern full of amethyst mountains, and Sir Edison Fitzwilly then engages the drill on the vehicle to bust through the rock, creating a water vortex that leads to the ocean. Not a lot of information or full video exists on what happens next, but riders somehow end up losing power and travel down a river, before then unexpectedly dropping off of a waterfall. With their adrenaline high, their thought waves restart the jubilium capacitors, and they regain control in the sky. I'm not sure how this happens next, but it appears that the vehicle travels back underground, and riders discover the Crystal of Zed. Sir Edison Fitzwilly then engages the tractor beam, but the ship loses power again, falling down a pit of sharp crystals, before then regaining control. At this conclusion, the quest is complete, and riders are thanked for their service. Questor's concept was incredibly weird, and really had nothing to do with the theme of either park that it premiered in, but it was apparently quite popular and remembered fondly by many. It also showed that Busch Gardens could financially hold its own against a strong competitor like Disney by embracing new and expensive technology to create its own unique attractions. Still, the 90s would bring Busch Gardens into even more direct competition with Disney, and so the next decade of expansion and theming is the most exciting yet. With the animal exhibits of Boma having long been incorporated into Nairobi, and with them feeling quite stale and really not up to the standards of the rest of the park, the African village area was demolished for a new and ambitious three-acre animal exhibit. Opening in 1992, Mayambe Reserve, the Great Ape Domain, helped to distinguish bush gardens in the Florida tourist market by introducing an immersive mountain trail where visitors could see new chimpanzee and gorilla exhibits. Guests enter by passing some gorilla statues and walk into the lush jungle trail. Shortly, they encounter the chimpanzees in a wide open space framed by cliffs and waterfalls. Continuing forward, visitors traverse the misty mountain path and find themselves on the other side of a gorge, fed by a waterfall where they can view the chimpanzee exhibit from another angle. Eventually, visitors pass through an overhang which is known as the Gorilla Research Outpost, and emerge out into a seating area where a cliffside gorilla exhibit is located. Trekking further into the jungle and into some caves, you can see new angles of the exhibit as you travel along your way to the exit. While Bush Gardens has a history of great animal exhibits, Mayambe Reserve might be my favorite because it's really well designed and quite immersive. While the chimps and gorillas are often shy and hard to spot, it's still a lush, cool, and well-themed exhibit to walk through with plenty of educational material found throughout, as well as animal ambassadors who will share interesting stories and facts. The next addition to Busch Gardens was about to go in a completely different direction though, and in 1993, the park opened what might be its most iconic coaster, Kumba. Designed by B&M, Kumba was a massive step up from Python and Scorpion in both scale and intensity, offering what was one of the most exciting coasters in the world at the time. Placed in the Congo area alongside the river rapids, Kumba brought crowds to the very back of the park, and as they approached over the bridges, 
the trains would twist and roar around them, creating what must have been terrifying intimidation, especially since coasters of this size and scale were still relatively new to most park goers. Obviously, Kumba was a massive hit, and its interlocking corkscrews were a visually pleasing element that immediately made their way into pretty much all advertising material for the park. Still, Kumba didn't just have a single novelty element like Python or Scorpion, but has many iconic elements, such as the loop that encircles the lift hill, or the cobra roll over one of the bridges. It was a new age for roller coasters, and Busch Gardens Tampa was helping to lead the way with its impressive new machine that would definitely change the course of the park towards bigger, badder coasters going forward. This step towards a more thrill-oriented park was also needed as the brewery tour came to an end in 1995, and it was demolished over the course of the next year. At this point in time, the Tampa Brewery was the smallest in the company, it was simply not useful in terms of demand, and so it was decided to close in favor of future attraction space. The adjacent bird gardens would still be preserved, but the dwarf village was becoming quite outdated and in need of an overhaul. The same year that the brewery tour closed, the former dwarf village reopened as the completely reimagined Land of the Dragons, which was highly themed to a village full of playful dragons. New children's rides were added, and old attractions from the dwarf village like the car ride were rethemed, and the former bounce house had a massive complex of ropes courses added above it. On the ground, splash pads with dragons could be found, and the area was anchored by a large treehouse which had a slide going down through its trunk, with rope bridges connecting to other parts of the land. Perhaps this doesn't sound like the most exciting addition, but at a time when Busch Gardens needed to distinguish itself from SeaWorld Orlando, which was owned by the company at this point, in addition to the rapidly expanding Walt Disney World and now Universal Studios Florida, this move made a lot of sense in appealing more broadly to families with young children. It was a great place to burn off energy, but was also really well-themed and aesthetically pleasant to experience. Still, Busch Gardens had a lot more expansion to do throughout the next half of the decade, and things would only continue to become more exciting. While Busch Gardens always needed to fight for its place among other Florida tourist attractions, Rumors in the industry were spreading that Disney was interested in building a fourth animal-themed park. With the 1995 announcement of Disney's Wild Animal Kingdom, Busch Gardens knew that they were being targeted just like Disney had done with Universal when it opened Disney MGM Studios in 1989. Luckily, Busch had already implemented plans for major new expansions, and in 1996, Egypt opened to the east of the Crown Colony House and Questor. In this new, highly-themed area full of shops and activities, Busch Gardens would continue to establish itself as a uniquely-themed park with must-see attractions. On the left side of the Egyptian Medway, the park offered a themed walkthrough experience titled King Tut's Tomb, which is intended to be a faithful recreation of the actual dig site. When walking into the building, visitors would wander hallways with Egyptian artifacts, and once settled in the first room, the doors would close and a projected film simulating a 1920s newsreel would provide backstory on the discovery. At one point, it is interrupted by a new narrator who reveals that he is Pharaoh Tutankhamun himself, and the film changes to mystical imagery as if you're looking into his memory. He shares his story of his own life and how he came to be entombed here with thieves stealing his possessions over the next subsequent millennia. He then invites you in to see his treasures, and a door opens, revealing the next room. Once settled, he welcomes you to the antechamber, and as the show progresses, lights reveal different treasures with him telling you their backstory, and how they related to his life as Pharaoh. At the conclusion, the lights dim and he invites you further into his tomb, unsealing it and leading to an impressive reveal of the next chamber, with his sarcophagus in the middle. Once the doors close, he begins narrating again, describing the funeral rites depicted on the walls, and the many possessions found in the chamber to help him survive the afterlife. At one point, he directs everyone's attention to his gold sarcophagus, and the lid is lifted, revealing his mummified remains and his impressive gold face mask that adorned his head. He provides more exposition on the meaning of his sarcophagus, and the lid then lowers. Later in the presentation, he speaks about idols that represent guardians that will aid him on his journey in the afterlife, and through either a lighting or mirror effect, his face mask reappears within a chamber. At the conclusion of the show, 
everyone is let out into a gift shop full of interesting ancient Egyptian merchandise, which adds some distinct variety to what was sold in the park. King Tut's tomb was interesting because it was educational, but even though I usually champion educational attractions, even I think it's a bit dull. Granted, certain segments were theatrical and the experience was atmospheric, but I can understand why show elements were later turned off sometime in the mid-aughts, becoming a straight walkthrough until it closed in 2013. However, as you approach the end of the Egyptian Midway, you would encounter a massive arch, and moving through it, park visitors would find the next major roller coaster. Called Montu, after an Egyptian god of war, the coaster was manufactured again by B&M and was their inverted model. While the first version of this coaster premiered as Batman the Ride at Six Flags Great America in 1992, Montu is arguably their best version of the model with its incredible intensity, pacing, and ridiculous whippy elements. Of course, what also allows Montu to really stand out is its impressive theming as it dives in and out of Egyptian ruins. Another element long forgotten is that when it initially opened, riders' feet would hang over a pit of crocodiles just right out of the station as the train turned into the lift hill. It's a bit difficult to see, but some surviving footage of this element does exist. Now, with four incredible coasters and unique theming, Busch Gardens was managing to distinguish itself as a major tourist destination distinct from any other park in Florida. The following year, in 1997, the park opened an ambitious themed animal trail known as the Edge of Africa, which took over a significant chunk of the African belt. Throughout, visitors can find new views of the belt, as well as exhibits for small animals like meerkats or African crested porcupines. However, the main appeal of the trail is the larger, more aggressive animals, and it has historically offered looks at hippopotamuses, hyenas, lions, painted dogs, and Nile crocodiles. They've changed exhibits over time, but large African predators have remained a consistent draw. The Edge of Africa was also useful in connecting Nairobi to Egypt, so that the park would have more walkability, and it's a good reason to go explore and see the animals here. Speaking of Egypt though, it would quickly get a new addition in 1998, with the closing of Questor and a re-theme to a new attraction called Akbar's Adventure Tours. This attraction first had guests step into a disheveled building working to part tourists with their money, advertising a tour of Egypt. On stepping into a pre-show room, guests are met by Akbar himself, a character played by Martin Short, who, by the way, is Canadian, playing a weaselly, greedy Egyptian con artist. Promising to be your guide, Akbar claims that he can aid you in touring Egypt in only five minutes with his homemade simulator, and he invites you further into his tent, only to discover that his items are being repossessed by a creditor named Stanford Wharton, played by Eugene Levy. Begging to Wharton, Akbar insists that he can pay his debts and make him rich if he just lets the tourists use his simulator, and Wharton reluctantly agrees. At the conclusion of this portion, riders move into the next room where they view a safety video and are assigned to their designated rows. Once the doors open and riders board the repurposed Questor vehicle, the experience begins with the first scene where tourists tour an Egyptian market on the back of a camel. It becomes apparent quickly that this is a contrived scene set up by Akbar, as voiceovers of Wharton and Akbar are heard arguing, but the cameraman accidentally bumps into a citizen, causing the marketplace to erupt into chaos, and eventually the scene ends. The attraction then transitions to a new reel, exploring the pyramids of Giza filmed from a helicopter, which almost crashes into one, and then finds itself in front of the Sphinx. However, due to the clumsiness of the pilot, who is assumed to be Akbar, the helicopter blade slashed into the structure, causing it to crumble and destroying the famous landmark. As the scene changes to the next reel, Wharton is overheard berating Akbar, who begs him to stay. Next, the reel starts playing a film shot in a spooky tomb from the perspective of a minecart, and as it loses momentum, a ghostly hand pulls the track switch and causes it to fly forward off the rails, crashing through signs warning of a curse. The cart comes to a stop, and out of nowhere, an animatronic mummy figure pops out of the top of the vehicle, startling riders and transporting them into a cursed nightmare. The vehicle begins moving down a staircase as Akbar pops up and screams at his projectionist to shut off the film, only for him to yell back that nothing is playing. It's quickly revealed that the simulator has been careening down a monstrous cobra, and as it lifts its head, it inspects the vehicle and attacks, 
sending Ryers through a wall and landing in a treasure room as it teeters dangerously, threatening to fall onto Akbar. He then realizes that he's in a room full of treasure and starts celebrating, but the room quickly grows dark, and the curse continues as the mummy manifests and continues attacking the tourists. He then throws the simulator up through a vertical chamber, causing it to blast off through the top of the pyramid. On turning back towards the ground, tourists bounce down the side of the structure and land in the sand below, witnessing Akbar fall into the ground and Wharton standing up, only to be crushed by a knockoff sarcophagus. It opens, and it's revealed that Wharton is seemingly okay as he's kissed by a mummy, and Akbar jokes that he's just a mummy's boy. Treasure from the pyramid begins raining down, and Akbar claims he's rich, and the attraction ends on a positive note, I suppose, as riders are instructed to leave and go to the Akbar snack bar. My issues with Martin Short playing a Weasley Egyptian character aside, the humor of the attraction is actually quite funny, and I think it would actually hold up today. Still, the attraction only ran for around four years before it being converted to a seasonal offering during busier times of the year, and permanently closed in 2007. The attraction was not something that I ever got to ride, but I did like how it fit thematically into Egypt, and at the very least seemed pretty fun, if only because it was just so outright stupid. If we jump to the other side of the park, I do want to quickly point out another addition in the late 90s. Just north of the Land of the Dragons, and connecting to the bridge that leads to Stanleyville, a sizable aviary known as Lorry Landing opened in 1998. It's covered by the shade of two large oak trees, and just inside is a series of small aviaries full of rotating exotic birds that seem to be different every time I visit. However, the main attraction is just through the doorways into the main exhibit, where you can walk around a nicely landscaped area full of many different birds, but mostly lorikeets, a parrot that specializes in feeding on nectar and is found in Australia. If you so choose, nectar is available to purchase and the birds will flock to you, but while this experience isn't unique to Bush Gardens, it is still a nice addition that's mostly out of the sun and is a fun way to get closer with some of the animals. So, Bush Gardens has just gone through an impressive decade of expansion throughout the 90s, but with the turn of the century, their momentum just keeps on going. In 1999, Busch Gardens opened yet another legendary coaster, Gwazi, which sat on the site of the former brewery. Generally, wooden coasters were not popular in Florida, as they were expensive to maintain in such hot and humid weather, but Bush ultimately decided on this massive dueling coaster constructed by GCI to distinguish it from both the park's own steel coaster lineup, as well as every other park in Florida, as none had anything like this. Gwazi had a station that was split into two sides, with one coaster being themed to a lion and the other to a tiger. Depending on which side you chose, the queue would be different, with the lion queue having sparse vegetation akin to a savanna, and the tiger queue being more luscious like a jungle. The name Gwazi refers to an African legend of a creature with a lion's body and a tiger's head, or at least that's what the park claims, and I'm pretty sure that's false, as tigers have not ever been native to Africa, as we established earlier. The concept of the attraction also loosely implies that the lion and tiger are fighting one another, so I'm not even sure how that fits in with their marketing gimmick. Still, what made Gwazi unique wasn't just that it was an incredible set of massive wooden coasters that Florida has not seen before or since, but that it actually dueled instead of racing. I don't think it's a coincidence that it opened the same year as Dueling Dragons, which opened with Islands of Adventure, and while I consider that to be the better attraction in terms of how it dueled, Gwazi still did have its trains pass by each other six separate times. I can attest that the ride experience in its early years was incredible and quite intense, as the trains relentlessly flew throughout the layout, but as it stopped dueling years later and the track got rougher, this once legendary attraction began to lose its appeal to park guests. Initially, Gwazi premiered with trains from the Philadelphia Toboggan Company, which was pretty standard for wooden coasters at the time, but as the coaster only continued to get rougher with age, Busch Gardens attempted to fix this problem first by retracking the lion side in 2009, the tiger side in 2010, and finally changing out the old trains for GCI's own Millennium Flyer trains in 2011. Personally, I can tell you that this worked great for a brief period of time, but the roughness quickly came back within just a year. 
Guazi was a huge deal for the park when it opened, not just because it was iconic for Busch Gardens, but because these truly were some of the best wooden coasters ever produced. They were fast, intense, unique, and unfortunately, rough enough that crowds lost interest, and the coaster had to close at the beginning of 2015. Moving on from Guazi, the next development for Busch Gardens was the introduction of Hell of Scream in 2000, an iconic haunt event for the park that has only continued to grow in size. There's a lot of history there, so it's not really fit for this video, but it has grown to become an important event hosted yearly that competes with Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios Florida, which has hosted its event since 1991. Whether it be the Dueling Guazi or Hall of Scream, Busch Gardens needed to distinguish itself as a worthy destination, and the following year, Busch Gardens would now take a shot at Disney. When Animal Kingdom opened in 1998, it was part competition with Islands of Adventure, part competition with Busch Gardens Tampa, and you can definitely see where they took influence. Parts of the Gorilla Falls Exploration Trail look incredibly similar to the Mayambe Reserve, and an attraction like Rafiki's Planet Watch, bringing you up close to animal care stations and highlighting Disney's own conservation program, seems quite similar conceptually to the Nairobi Field Station. There's a lot more similarities that you can draw between the two parks, but what was unique to Animal Kingdom was Kilimanjaro Safaris, having riders board real trucks and driving them around the fictional Harambe Wildlife Reserve to see real animals. Well, Busch Gardens decided that this is exactly what they wanted to do, and in 2001, opened a new attraction in Nairobi known as Rhino Rally. The concept behind the ride is that you board a Land Rover and drive through an off-road course, where you'll splash through rivers to see a variety of African animals up close. It's a bit of an ironic concept, as the ride actually first starts by passing the Asian Elephant exhibit, but Rhino Rally also never took itself too seriously, with the drivers often cracking jokes and puns, spiced in along with the educational information about the animals. On its own, Rhino Rally was just a much shorter, less landscaped version of Kilimanjaro Safaris, but there was one unique element that really stood out. Towards the end of the course, the road would split, and if this section wasn't working, which it often wasn't due to technical issues, the driver would turn right and return to the station. If the driver turned left, however, they would drive into a jungle and encounter a floating bridge that spanned a small river. As the truck drives slowly onto the bridge, riders on the left are misted by the aggressive waterfall, and the truck then proceeds to stop. The waterfall instantly becomes more aggressive, dislodging a section of the bridge with the truck still on it, and everyone begins to start floating down the river. For the next three minutes, the bridge floats through the water, which was achieved through a unique hidden track system developed by Vacoma. Along the way, riders travel through a tight gorge, just nearly miss another waterfall, and see a boat that has crashed against the rocks. Just past this, a collapsed bridge reveals an abandoned rescue vehicle, and on rounding the bend, the raft rotates as it approaches the bridge debris as if riders were going to crash. Luckily, the raft slows down, allowing the driver to pull out onto the pathway, which shortly brings riders back to the station. Rhino Rally was ridiculously popular, and while the animal section wasn't as interesting or well-themed as Kilimanjaro Safaris, the raft portion was really clever and helped the attraction stand out because of just how unique this was. Unfortunately, due to technical issues, the river portion often didn't work, and it did close permanently in 2010, which really took away a lot from the experience. From here, Rhino Rally would continue existing with just its safari portion, but it just wasn't the same. And, due to technical issues with the Land Rovers, and a lack of visitor interest, it eventually closed in 2014. In 2004, Busch Gardens would receive two new additions that are worth noting. The first was a mock wild mouse coaster in Timbuktu, which replaced the Crazy Camel. This coaster was originally erected in Williamsburg in 1996, but was relocated to Tampa, given a new paint job and renamed to Cheetah Chase. It's not a huge coaster by any means, but I've always enjoyed a good wild mouse, and so I thought it was a fun addition to this area. In the same year, the Moroccan Palace Theatre would premiere a new show known as Katonga, and while a number of other shows have come and gone since the theatre opened, the majority of which involved ice skating, this one was probably the most ambitious that the park has ever seen. 
Katonga is described as a musical celebration of animal folklore, and had many impressive, distinct sets that were often accompanied by ambitious puppetry. To be fair, I know very little about Broadway-style shows or their production value, so I don't know how something like Katonga stacks up to them, but the show was reportedly extremely ambitious for something designed for a theme park. I had only managed to see it once, which was relatively soon after it opened, but I remember liking it a lot more than I would have anticipated, and it would be great to see Busch Gardens return with something like this. Unfortunately, Katonga concluded its run in 2010, and the theater has since hosted a number of other shows based around ice skating, including the show known as Ice Poration, which seemed to be interesting and still had an African theme. However, its most recent show, Turn It Up, is just not it. And while the performers are talented, the show itself is as generic as it gets. Moving on, Busch Gardens would take a huge step forward again in 2005, with its introduction of Shikra to Stanleyville. At the time, B&M dive coasters were incredibly new and novel, with the first premiering in 1998 at Alton Towers as Oblivion. For Busch Gardens to get the first of this ride model in North America was huge, drawing many people to the park, but what also distinguished it was that it improved on the model by offering a true 90 degree drop straight down, which previous versions did not. Also notable about Shikra is that it's not just a one trick pony with the first drop, as it proceeds to ascend into an Immelman, and from there, approaches a second smaller but still steep drop into a tunnel. Coming out of it, the train banks right, splashing down into the water for dramatic effect as if a bird is diving for fish, creating a splash that soaks unsuspecting park goers down on the pathway. Not only is Shikra a great dive coaster with a little more substance, but it plays with the landscape as an awe-inspiring kinetic machine. With Shikra came a revival of Stanleyville, which was always one of the weaker areas of the park thematically. It introduced new rolling structures around the coaster which have a unique aesthetic, as well as introducing the Zambia Smokehouse, which serves plates of barbecue. Shikra was a successful and distinct addition to the park for sure. However, the following year, Python would be removed, and part of the Congo went under construction for what looked to be an exciting renovation. In 2008, the area reopened as Jangala, which incorporated pretty much all of the Congo before the bridges that lead to the River Rapids in Kumba. The previous Kuala Island was expanded with an ambitious tiger exhibit known as the Tiger Trail, and across the way, a new orangutan exhibit was created. However, at the back of the area where the python once stood was the Treetop Trails, an area geared towards children that offered extensive rope bridges and climbing structures throughout themed rock work. Inside, a few small rides and animal exhibits could be found as well, which would bring people up to animal enclosures in unique ways. Jungala always felt like a weird addition to me because it was just north of the Land of Dragons, and seemed redundant by offering a lot of the same things. The new animal exhibits were cool, especially as the Tiger Trail had unique ways of bringing you up close to the beasts themselves, but this addition never felt necessary to me, as the theme didn't really make sense with the rest of the park. Still, this was the very last project to come from under the leadership of Anheuser-Busch, and the park was about to enter a new and uncertain era. On July 13th, 2008, massive beer brewer InBev purchased Anheuser-Busch for a sum of $52 billion, allowing it to become the largest brewer in the world. With the merger of the two companies in 2009, they now became Anheuser-Busch InBev, and having absolutely no interest in running the parks, sold this division for a sum of $2.3 billion to Blackstone, a massive alternative investment company that renamed this division to SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment, because SeaWorld was considered to be the stronger of Anheuser-Busch's park brands. Initially, things seemed good, as most leadership was kept in place, and the parks were allowed to operate and expand as normal. The next change made to the parks after the acquisition was in 2010, when the Land of the Dragons was rethemed into Sesame Street Safari of Fun, wanting to use the Sesame Street IP to draw people back to the area. It, unfortunately, was never as interesting, as a lot of new small rides were just added wherever they could fit, and many previous elements were removed, such as an interactive exhibit in the treehouse, and certain rope playgrounds were blocked off from access. 
Walking around today, you can see remnants of the old lands that were never removed, such as the tales from the former splash pad areas, or even a few rides that were lazily rethemed. Still, not everything post sell off was so bad, and the most significant addition for Bush Gardens at this time was the introduction of a new Intamin coaster, Cheetah Hunt, which took over the old monorail station in 2011. While not my favorite coaster, Cheetah Hunt is notable for having a unique layout and sporting three LSL launches. The first brings you out of the station and into a left banked turn, then dipping down into a trench where you encounter the second launch and run up a weird but unique elevated figure 8 element known as the Windcatcher Tower. Coming out of this, the coaster dives down a trench and emerges out into Nairobi before eventually reaching its wanted version, a heartline roll. Coming out of this, the train then descends down into the former water portion of Rhino Rally, weaving throughout the rockwork as if running on water. The footage I have of the coaster is of when the water is shut off, but it's usually quite interesting as you graze the flowing river. Entering the third and final launch, the train then weaves its way back through Nairobi until it returns to the station. Again, Cheetah Hunt is not the most exciting coaster in the park, but I do appreciate its cheetah theme with its focus on speed, and the layout and elements are really unlike anything else. With Cheetah Hunt came Cheetah Run, a small exhibit where the Clydesdale Hamlet used to be that features these oversized house cats, with the stables becoming an indoor facility where they are housed overnight. Also a quick note, but to avoid confusion with the names Cheetah Chase in Book 2 was renamed to Sand Serpent right before Cheetah Hunt opened. The following year, the Animal Care Center opened in Nairobi, which allows visitors to view various animals as they receive care in this new medical facility. Most people often walk by this building without bothering to see what's in it, but if you're interested in learning about exotic animal care, it does offer something interesting. However, 2013 was the year that Blackfish was released, causing absolute financial devastation as people began boycotting SeaWorld parks. And surprisingly, the Busch Gardens parks were hit pretty badly too. Still, this couldn't stop projects that were already in development, and in 2014, Timbuktu was rethemed to Pantopia. The once mysterious Sandy City was repainted to be bright and colorful, and the Sandstorm was replaced with another significant park addition, Falcon's Fury. Advertising a 355-foot drop, this intimate produced drop tower brings riders to the top, only to put their seats up at the feet, having them stare down at the ground before suddenly releasing and hurtling towards the ground. While I liked and preferred the old aesthetic of Timbuk2 because I liked its grittiness, I don't really mind the Pantopia refresh, although I can see why some people might find it a little too much. I think it also moves away from the African theme a bit because it can come off as thematically ambiguous just like Jungala, but it's otherwise relatively inoffensive in terms of aesthetics. While I missed the Sandstorm, Falcon's Fury was a great addition that is still quite popular, and even though it hasn't been around for long, I feel that it has actually already become an iconic part of park history. Following Pantopia, another project already in development that came to fruition was the introduction of Cobra's Curse to Egypt in 2016. As the second mock coaster in the park, Cobra's Curse is a more family-oriented addition that features spinning trains and weaves throughout the landscape. As you move through the queue, you actually move through the old structure that housed King Tut's tomb, which adds a nice bit of atmosphere and, most importantly, air conditioning as you wait. Relatively close to the platform before you board, riders also pass through a chamber where a projected pre-show gives you backstory on the attraction, describing an Egyptian snake king who went mad with power, granted to him from a cobra statue. Eventually, he was deposed and the statue destroyed, but not before he placed a curse on any who dared to reassemble the statue's pieces and try to claim his power for their own. The coaster itself is quite unique, first sending you up an elevator lift, which I think is intended to have been erected by archaeologists when trying to piece the statue back together. As you ascend, you can hear the king announcing his awakening, and on reaching the top, the track dips you into the cobra statue's mouth, and then proceeds chaotically throughout the next section of the ride course. Shortly, the ride vehicles spin to face backwards through another segment, and a while later in the ride, as you ascend a lift hill, the vehicles are fully unlocked sending you through the last half of the course with no control over how your vehicles will spin. Cobra's Curse is a decent family coaster with adequate theming and a small story which is more than I really expected from Bush. 
It also plays well kinetically as it moves throughout the land right next to Montu, and is an overall positive but not game-changing addition to the park's coaster lineup. So while these additions from this period of park history were positive thematically, they never really made the impact needed to assist the park financially. In 2013, SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment went public, and after reeling from Blackfish, Blackstone sold its stake to a Chinese firm known as Zhang Hong Group in 2017. They in turn encountered serious financial trouble, and quickly sold their shares in 2019, which SeaWorld partially bought back, but the majority went to Hillpath Capital, which gained a controlling interest of 34.5%, and still maintains that control today. If you want more information on the corporate drama that has really affected the parks for the worse, I've actually already done a video on this that I will link to in the description, because it's a really interesting story. Still, while Busch Gardens Tampa came out of this period with some pretty solid additions, the park began going downhill quickly, which brings us to the abrupt fall. As SeaWorld Parks continued to struggle post-Blackfish, a lot of different things were tried in the parks to revive attendance, but the company ultimately began moving towards new and thrilling roller coasters as the main draw. Big coasters certainly helped grow Busch Gardens Tampa, as its history can show, but there was always a lot more added alongside these coasters that made the park so appealing. At this point in time, there seems to be no plans for any new animal exhibits, no new significant theming, or any new rides or shows that would appeal to a broader family demographic that might not necessarily be interested in intense thrills. As SeaWorld decided that it was mostly going to be concerned with roller coasters going forward, the first new addition of this era would be built on the former site of the Tidal Wave, which closed in 2016. Debuting in 2019, Tigris was a premier rides launch coaster with a clones layout known as the Skyrocket 2, and is the ninth version of this coaster to have been built. Personally, I hate Tigris because Premier has the absolute worst cramped trains, but I don't really think it was an interesting addition to the park either, as it was just a clone that didn't impact the park much. While it is true that I thought that Python was a good addition back in the day despite being a clone, it was very much new, novel, and exciting to its audience. Tigris though is just another mid-tier roller coaster that could exist just fine in a Six Flags or Cedar Fair park, and doesn't stand out among Busch Gardens' more unique coaster collection. Luckily for coaster fans, rumors began to surface of a partial steel conversion for Gwazi, which had been standing but not operating since 2015. Work began on this coaster, and as it was coming together, people began to be excited about what came next. Yet 2020 brought the worldwide shutdown, and while SeaWorld Parks reopened as quickly as they could, the financial impact was severe, and its opening was obviously delayed. The new structure sat for two years until it finally opened in 2022 as Iron Gwazi, sporting new crocodile-themed trains and having been converted into an absolute behemoth by RMC, as another showstopper on the same level that the BNMs have been in decades prior. Yet, unless you're going in the peak of summer or on a holiday weekend, Iron Gwazi is just a five-minute wait most of the time. What should have been a major draw to the park isn't working because so much has declined in terms of quality as SeaWorld Parks ran through different owners, and Hillpath Capital is by far the worst. While a lot can be blamed on the events of 2020, it's clear that Hillpath Capital is only really interested in jacking up prices, cutting staffing, cutting maintenance and cleanliness, and trying to cut corners at every opportunity that they can. I've been going to Busch Gardens far less frequently than I did prior to 2020, but I've seen the park decline quite rapidly every time I have. If you walk around, you'll see animal exhibits that have been closed or empty for years, and even entire sections of the park are inaccessible. For example, the Tiger Trail is open, but its exhibits are mostly empty, and the Jungala Treetop Trails have not reopened since the park did. In terms of entertainment, the park has almost no shows, although they are promising to bring back a revised version of Turn It Up, but still, it's not really a draw for anyone. Granted, if you like coasters, then the park's lineup is still really strong, but when you're waiting 40 minutes for Cheetah Hunt when the park is a ghost town, or 10 minutes per dispatch on Iron Gwazi because the operations are so slow, 
it really reveals how poorly the place is run. I don't blame operations for being slow, as management is cutting staffing to the bone, and the pay is worse than inadequate, but you can't generate interest in a park where everything is run so poorly. Even the new addition for 2023, Serengeti Flyers, which is an SNS scream and swing placed over what was the former Rhino Rally queue, takes a significant amount of time to dispatch as riders just sit there baking in the sun for 5 minutes. It's a fun flat ride that could have made a larger impact if anyone cared to go to the park, but it seems to be really struggling to attract people. Most recently, Sand Serpent was demolished along with the Phoenix, which has just been sitting there for years anyways, and the rumor is that a new family coaster will be coming to Pantopia. Yet, I think that just like Pipeline, which just opened at SeaWorld Orlando in 2023, there won't be much impact because these parks have declined so quickly. In fairness, not everything is bad, as despite the issues I have with missing animals, Busch Gardens is accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, signifying that they take really good care of their animals, and this is something that is always a highlight of the park. If I have to say something else positive too, it's that among the exceptionally strong heat waves this summer, Busch Gardens is doing significantly better than any other parks in addressing it, as everywhere you go there are misters, recently added shade structures, and even giant fans scattered throughout the park. Still, Busch Gardens is definitely on the decline, and thrill rides with poor operations just can't save it, so let's take a look back at what we just learned. Reviewing the extensive history we just covered, seeing this park grow from the humble brewery tour and the bird gardens, expanding significantly and thoughtfully throughout the 70s and 80s, and becoming competitive with Disney, Universal, and SeaWorld in the 90s and mid-aughts, it's disappointing to see it have become the Six Flags of Tampa, concerned only with adding thrill rides and cutting costs to the absolute bare minimum, which impacts the experience greatly. At its core, Busch Gardens is a park that could appeal to families if it added more accessible, family-oriented attractions, such as strong-themed shows, additional animal exhibits, and even a few quality dark rides. Granted, SeaWorld has mostly had an extremely poor track record of these, but with the right investment and execution, it could generate the kind of positive buzz that the park needs going forward. The park itself already has great animal exhibits which are popular and accessible to everyone, but its focus almost exclusively on thrills, and especially roller coasters, is not at all working to keep the park sustainable into the future, which is sad because it's a park with such a rich history that has existed as a cultural institution of Tampa Bay for so long. Looking back, Busch Gardens Tampa has had a fascinating history that only continued to get more exciting throughout the decades as it rose to become one of the most unique theme parks ever created. Yet, its fall happened so quickly after its acquisition by Blackstone and was blindsided by the impact of Blackfish, quickly becoming a plaything for other investment firms that are only interested in squeezing as much money out of these parks as possible until they're bled dry. I hope that Busch Gardens Tampa has a bright future ahead of it because there's so much potential here for something great, but I just don't see it happening, and the future plans do not leave me optimistic. So, if you made it here to the end of the video and haven't yet left a like, again, that's something that really helps me out in reaching a wider audience. As always, if you have not yet subscribed and hit the bell icon either, you can do so now to be alerted to new videos as they release.